Here is a Milwaukee tool that some people are talking about. I would say that everyone is talking about it, but we all know that is a big fat lie. This is the Milwaukee tool top off. I have run into a few situations where having an outlet capable of supplying 175 watts would have come in handy. A good example would be when I was using my laptop in my truck right up until the battery was depleted and I still needed the thing. I wanted so badly to just plug in one of the numerous M18 batteries I had in my cab. I now know what it feels like to need a drink of water and be stranded on the ocean. The top off is something that Milwaukee Tool needed to make, and I'm glad it's here. So before I get into what this thing actually does, I wanted you to know that I do recommend getting one, but only if you have a few M18 batteries. So right out of the gate, you see that they warn you that this does not output a sinusoidal waveform. So if you thought you were going to get a true sinusoidal waveform out of this $100 top off, I have some land for you in Alaska that you might be interested in purchasing. The only thing I couldn't let go was the fact that they didn't tell you what the waveform they were producing actually was. Modified sine wave, square wave, pulse sine wave, I don't know, they didn't tell me. <laughs> Being an electrical engineer, I could not let this go and had to hook it up to my oscilloscope. Just so you know, I'm not gonna be diving into the total harmonic distribution. It's gonna be bad, so just go with that. We are going to be performing three tests with this thing. The first test will be attaching it to an oscilloscope and looking at the voltage peak to peak as well as the frequency. The second will be putting it directly to a multimeter and measuring the RMS voltage. And the third will be connecting up to a fan through a power meter. Take note of my setup here. I have the top off and a power switch over here on this bench. And over on this bench, I have my meters as well as my probe that is held in with a vise to hold the cabling for added safety, of course. There are a reason that these cables are commonly referred to as suicide cables. Hopefully you can see that this is quite dangerous. <laughs> You'll also notice that I have my line voltage cut shorter than my neutral. I'm not saying you should do any of this, but in case you decide to, keep safety in mind. I already checked my O-scope with uh, some DC voltage on that thing on the top of it over there. So we should be good to go. Let's check the house's outlet first, just to show you what a sine wave looks like, if you didn't already know. Okay, this guy's kind of old, but it gets the job done. Gotta warm up, there we go. Uh, so we're good settings. I kind of already played with this on AC just to get it up and running, so. Should be good to go. I'm gonna go ahead and flip the power switch. Wish me luck. Fun, fun, fun. Okay, so this since this is old, we're going to have to do some fun stuff. If you ever if you've ever seen a sine wave before, you'll know that this is one. I'll do a stop motion screenshot of this just to show you what exactly we're looking at and we'll do a, some nice little analysis on here. Our peak to peak should be close to 340, assuming the RMS is 120, and one cycle should span about 16, 17 milliseconds. That looks about right, so there you have it. This is what you would expect from the power grid. Now let's see what our top off looks like. All right, so I'm gonna hit the button just so we can kind of see it flicker on screen. Let's see what we got. And there it is. Okay, I do not, what on earth is going on here? Ooh, let's see if we can stop that for you. Okay, there's our waveform. Uh, that looks, that, so these older models kind of make little squiggly lines like that when they're doing square waves, but even that looks pretty bad. Um, why don't I go ahead and connect up the old ground pin here. I don't think this will do anything, but you know, give it every little help it gets here. Oh, well, look at that. That helps it out a lot. Uh, just for the record that doing that to AC does, does nothing. <laughs> it doesn't help it or hinder it at all. Uh, with the probe, it, it shouldn't. It, 
shouldn't need a reference, but again, this is not a true sine wave, so shouldn't be that surprised. All right, let's get another sh close up of this one here. Do a little stop motion. All right. Okay, that that's about what I would expect here. You can kind of see that there is not as good of a peak to peak on this one. It's in fact, you can see kind of the remnants from the other from the sine wave on there. It's much lower than a true sinusoidal waveform. So that's a little interesting. Even with the square wave inverters, they usually try and hit the very similar peak to peak. I don't know why this is the case here. Uh, you know what, just for grins here, let's go ahead and add something else on the load of this guy and see if that changes anything. So I added the fume extractor on there. We'll turn it on and we'll turn on our after there okay let's go back to our waveform okay a little bit different let's stop that for ye all right so that's what it looks like under load uh still hitting about those same peaks sorry we don't need that on anymore uh, it looks like when you add a load on there, it's much more stabilized as far as a, a square wave output. So that's good news, but just on its own with no load, it um, was that pathetic thing you saw before. But again, the peaks are still, you can still kind of see, you can still kind of see a little outline right here. You, you can see the peaks are, are much lower than an actual, what you get from the wall. So that will move us on to our next test, which is trying to read what the true RMS value is. Well, this isn't really true RMS. We're gonna get a RMS value. And how we're gonna grab that is I got these two prongs here. So we're gonna kill this. We're not gonna need, oh, careful here. It, it's off, nothing's gonna, I'm not gonna hurt myself, but we're gonna connect this up. And then we're gonna connect this up. And I should have done this a little differently, but that should be fine. So this is our RMS, not under load, although it might be tricking it to thinking it's under load from our last test, but I'm gonna turn the fan on. And there we go. Okay, when we have a actual load on there, it bumps it up to, 106, 107. It's close to 110, but uh, it's, it's not. So for reference, let's plug this into the wall. Okay, that's plugged in and we're actually just ready to go. It was already on. And we're reading 121, which is what I typically will read out here. Let me turn the fan on, on the same circuit. And it should be pretty stabilized because I have other things hooked up to my home's outlets. So that's in order. So that's the difference between the voltage out. That, that's not a deal breaker. You'll hear a lot of people refer to main power as 110. It's close to that under load. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting that it doesn't just provide the base voltage right from the get-go it kind of waits for a load which means this thing is probably doing a quite a bit of monitoring and it might be using that initial waveform as kind of like a check or something it is very much a square wave inverter that's not terrible but you did notice the voltage is lower which brings us to our final test for this one i am not gonna need my suicide cable anymore Thank goodness. This is more of a real world test that shows you what you're sacrificing when you use this instead of the power grid. All right, we're gonna turn that on. Get our meter plugged in here. There's our readout. All right, so it was important to give you the background so you understand the natural conclusion. Since the voltage is lower and the waveform is all chopped up, you will notice how slowly this fume extractor starts up when I use the top off as the supply. Yep, 
you also will notice that it draws less than the 30 watts that the supplier says this thing's gonna draw. Since the voltage this thing supplies is lower than what the manufacturer tested at, and the power is calculated by multiplying the voltage and the current, and you get the current by dividing the voltage by the impedance, since the impedance of this load is the only constant, well, you do the math. Oh, and don't forget to correct for the power factor. Now, <coughs> Listen to the fume extractor when I plug it into the wall outlet. Notice how smooth it kicked on and how quickly it got up to speed. When you hear people talk about how inverters can damage sensitive electronics, this is how. When you supply electronics with voltage outside of the specified range, everything downstream from the power supply acts in an unexpected or undesirable way. Going way too far outside those limits will typically cause destruction. However, this fume extractor will not suffer any damage due to lower than the requested operating voltage. The windings of the motor will not build up any excess heat and the bearings of the fan blade will not experience any additional wear. See, look, it looks perfectly fine. That is because the inverter airs on the low end. So the worst thing that will happen to any AC power device, the top off is asked to power, is that it will not spin as fast or just not turn on at all. The top off also appears to monitor the current and shut off in case your load is more resistive and tries to pull too much. Even with that in mind, I would stay away from trying to power hand tools since you don't know what their power factor is and they could theoretically try to draw infinite current. This happens more often than you think, which is why our homes are protected with circuit breakers. Even though that low voltage may struggle with some AC equipment, it is perfectly fine for laptops, televisions, and other small electronic devices. Most, if not all, consumer electronics will design their power supplies to take anywhere from 90 to 240 VAC, either 50 or 60 hertz. This is so they can guarantee that they will operate in a plethora of places and will not have to worry about region locking their stuff. Also, since anything with a microcontroller is powered off of direct current, the first thing the device does is convert that harmful alternating current waveform into a direct current waveform through the use of a full bridge rectifier and will condition it depending upon how picky its components downstream are. Meaning the supply waveform does not have to be that pretty. <laughs> However, if the manufacturer relies on the AC signal for any sort of reference voltage as well as power, do not use this. A device that does this will tell you by putting the label near its power entry. It will usually say, do not plug into a generator or inverter. Uh, as I said, I still think it's great. It's um, thinking more on that waveform again. It's, it's actually more likely a modified sine wave since it had two little uh, DC slashes there, not just a, not just one on the top, one on the bottom. It had kind of one in the middle, so it was actually kind of doing one of these Got My finger's not gonna do it for you. But uh, I just know it, it, it's a little better than just a regular square wave. Uh, and it does hit close to the 110, which is what most people really go for. So I feel a lot better <coughs> doing that, <laughs> knowing what this guy actually outputs. Uh, than I did before, so that is good. This scary warning on the back kind of had me curious, and I just, I, I really needed to know, and now I do. And now you do as well. Don't forget to subscribe and like it. Um, and if you do, I'll probably goof around with more tool-based stuff in the future. All right, until next time, I'm the Ill-Informed Human. Goodbye.